Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. He does. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we've been talking about generosity. And the first message in our series, just to catch you up, is that God is generous and he gives us the ability to be generous because of how generous he is. And because he's generous, he wants us to be like him. He wants us to be generous as well. The second message I shared was that the heart of generosity is we have to guard our hearts because our hearts can sabotage our finances, sabotage our savings, our spending, and even our giving. And God's given us a new heart to be generous. So guard your heart during the season. How many are just happy that Black Friday and stuff is over with? I got so many emails. I'm going to say something about that later. But my goodness, I was getting bombarded with emails. Um, and then I talked about uh, last, uh, a couple weeks ago, prioritize giving. Those who are generous, they prioritize God first. And they make sure they're giving to God. And so in order for you to become generous, you have to start with giving. And so I encourage everyone to make sure God is first in your finances, in that area of your life, not just in um, other areas of your life. Lives. So lastly... Here's the, this, this, is a, this is a powerful scripture today, because I want you to see what we can experience when we are generous, and what's going to take place, and there's eternal dividends to our generosity that I want us to see as well, so I'm excited about this message, and my hope and prayer is that this series, in this series, you get to experience the joy of giving and generosity, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say this is probably one of the most powerful scriptures in the New Testament about giving. One of the most powerful scriptures in the New Testament about giving. And uh, let's jump right in. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, let me give you some context though first. Paul was taking a collection uh, of offering for a church in Jerusalem, and he's talking to the Gentile churches, and he's taking this big collection. He's going to meet, he's going to uh, send some companions, Titus and some other companions, to collect this offering. And so it's been about a year now, and what they did in 1 Corinthians 16 is Paul instructed them to set aside a portion of their finances every week, the first day of the week. So for them, the first day of the week was Sunday. So on Sunday, they would set aside a portion of their giving every week to be collected for the collection for Paul. So that's kind of where the church, where church gets the idea of giving on Sundays. And so he's getting ready to collect it. And the church in Jerusalem is a very critical church. It's an important church that that Paul is trying to help fund. They're, they're more poor than the Gentile church. The oppression on the Jews was so bad that they needed help. And so Paul's taking his collection from all these different churches in different regions in the Gentile area. And so he's telling them, hey, prepare it. And this is what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. Now, he's talking to the Corinthian church, but he's talking a little bit here about the Macedonian church. Which ones are those? Philippi, Berea, and Thessalonica. These three churches he's getting ready to talk about, and he's using them as an example to encourage the Corinthians to follow through with their giving. He says this, they are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. Now, you would think that he would brag on a church or church is where they have a lot of money. But instead, he's getting ready to brag on a church that's very poor and going through many trials. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. Now, this part baffles me when I read this. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They're, they're poor. They're going through trials. Uh, the churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea were, were persecuted very badly. And they're begging Paul to give. Now, why could that be? Because Paul may have told them not to. 
Paul may have told them not to, but they were so full of joy from knowing Christ because their, their joy wasn't tied to their money. Their joy was tied to Christ. And they were so full of joy that they're like, no, we want to give. They are literally begging Paul to give. How cool is that? How cool is it to be in, are we awake church? How cool is that? Think about that for a second. Think about an area that's going through trials that is poor and they're begging to give money. Would you see that here in America? I don't know, maybe. That'd be great. Paul's like, ah, possibly scholars say, think that he was possibly saying don't, but they're begging to. And this is what he goes on to say in verse 5. They even did more than we had hoped for, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to. That's interesting. This is key. Their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to the church family. So guess what was first on their mind in their giving? Obedience to God. Worshiping God. Making sure they do this for God. They're not doing this for Paul. They're not giving for, for Paul. They're giving because God. Because God has been generous to them. God has been faithful to them. Even in their persecution, the Macedonian churches are giving to the Lord. And they want to help other church family members in need in Jerusalem. And in church, I want you to know this. When we give, when I give to this church, I'm giving it to God first. No matter what's going on here, no matter what happens here, no matter what's said or not said, what's done or not done, I give to God first before I give to anything else. We give back to our generous God. I think that's just so important. I'm just amazed that you can be generous even in your trials. And has it been a trying year or what? It's been a trying year. Well, he goes on to say this in verse 6. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Now, he's talking to the Corinthian church again. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. So the Corinthian church was very good at many things. They were excelling in so many areas, but spiritual growth, spiritual maturity also includes our giving. And that's what Paul is trying to say here. And he says this, I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches. Now, what's interesting is if you're going through a hard time, you'll find out how much someone loves you, won't you? When you're going through some fiery trials, it tests the genuine love of another person, doesn't it? In fact, we don't realize how much someone loves us until we go through some difficult seasons, don't we? And we don't realize how strong or how weak our love is until we go through a difficult time. Paul praised the church of Thessalonica when he wrote the letters to 1st and 2nd Thessalonians for being so generous in their persecution. Their love for God was so strong, again, that they were begging Paul to be involved in this collection of offerings. But here's the thing. It was the Macedonian church that was, I'm sorry, it was the Corinthian church that inspired the Macedonian church in the first place. And Paul's saying, I, I want you to look at the eagerness of the Macedonian church who's going through so much. Would you match that? Would you consider being and following through with what you started? And then he gives us this powerful verse that just messes me up. In verse 9, he says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Wow. You know what Paul's saying to the church? Be like Jesus in your giving. Be like Jesus in your giving. You know what's crazy too is Jesus became poor... I mean, he had nothing. 
He, he didn't live, when he did his ministry, he had no home. He used everyone else's homes. He wasn't a mooch, he just lived on hospitality. Okay? Jesus had nothing in his name, and yet he was the most generous person who ever lived. Doesn't that say something profound? That we can be generous even when we don't have a lot. That God is looking at your heart, not how much you give. He's looking at your heart and what you're willing to give in your life. And Jesus was generous with his whole life, his entire life. And praise God for that. Paul goes on to say this, here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Now here's the thing about the Corinthian church. They were very wealthy. It was a port uh, for ships and commerce. It was a commercial area. They had a lot of money. We don't know why they were reluctant to continue following through with their giving, but they had not completed it yet. And so Paul was just making sure that they are ready when he comes. So he's not accusing them of not finishing. He's actually just saying, be ready because I'm sending Titus because you guys started the whole idea of giving. You guys sparked this inspiration, follow through with it. And so Paul is sending Titus and the companions to prepare. But they are part of a very wealthy community. If anyone's able to give, guess, what it, guess who it is? The Corinthian church. You know what Paul could be trying to say here too is, is those who have the funds, right? Follow through with it. Let it be your heart. But he doesn't command them to do it. He wants them to do it from their heart. He's not even coercing them to do it either. And this is what he says in verse 12. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now you have plenty and can help those who are rich in need. Later they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. As the scriptures say, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Now I'm going to get a little, I'm going to go down a little path here real quick. Some people use this as a text for communism because of equality giving. This is not a form of communism. This is a form of generosity. Okay, communism would say you have to give. You have to give up this tax. You have to do this. You have to do this. Everyone has to have the same amount. That's not the case. Basically, what he's saying is right now, you're not in need. The Jerusalem church is in need. Would you give? And if you're in need, their generosity will give back. It's just, this is going to be a hard word to say. Reciprocity? Reciprocity, yeah, okay. There, it was reciprocal giving, okay? Let's go with that. And I did that with a dry mouth, that's not bad. It was giving, they were just taking care of each other. So let's, let's put it this way. If we were in trouble here, but another church, another state was like, hey, we're gonna help you out. And then we, when they're in trouble, we help them. It's all free will giving. It's not forced. So a lot of people misinterpret that scripture to use it for their agendas and you shouldn't use it like that. Now, Exodus 16, 18 is what he's referring to here when he says, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over and those who gathered only a little had enough. What is he talking about here? He's actually talking about the time where God provided manna and quail for the Israelites in the desert. And here's what would happen. They would collect a certain amount every night, two quarts per person in the household. Okay, it's a little early, so I don't want to do the math, but I think I got this right. Eight quarts, family of four. Did I get it right? I think I did. Good. Eight quarts for a family of four. If someone grabbed nine quarts, the next day when it was all over, it would be gone. If someone gathered just enough, they had enough. In other words, if they tried to gather too much, it turned into maggots and worms, according to scripture. If you didn't grab quite enough, you had enough. Why? Because God was showing them that I'll take care of you. Just gather what you need today. Trust me today, 
and you'll have enough. And God, by the way, is enough. And God is the source of our provision. And so he was teaching them to trust him and providing for them every single day. Could it be that Jesus, when he said, give us today our daily bread, that this could be in mind when he prayed that? That every day God will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory, as another scripture says. Praise God for that. So that's what he's saying here. Now we need to jump into 2 Corinthians 9. I'm going to start with verse 6. He's basically, uh, before that, he's basically telling them again, I'm sending my brothers to you. They're ready. I've been telling them about the money that's been collected. Um, and he goes into verse 5, actually, and he says this. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be willing gift, a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, he says in verse 6. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God would generously provide all you need. Then you will have then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And I read that uh, last week. Now, I want to illustrate this today. Um, did anyone get some free money on the way in today? That's a first. I made a joke earlier in the office. People are going to get money from church today. Usually we ask for money, don't we? So today, I had two of our staff members practice this principle of sowing and reaping. So Sam, if you could come up and uh, Cornelius, wherever you are, brother, come on up here and um, maybe stand on the left over here. And, and Sam, you can stand over here. Uh, we're going to do, we did a little human experiment. We're going to see who's more generous today. <laughs> Just having fun though. Come on the stage so they can see you if you don't mind. All right. Okay. So if you received an envelope from Sam, right here, would you stand, if you don't mind, if you received an envelope from Sam? Okay, one, two, three. All right. Now, here's a catch. I gave both of them $10 to sew. All right? Okay. Thank you. You may be seated. And by the way, you actually get to keep that dollar or you can do whatever you want with it. We're really giving away money today. Cornelius, I gave you $10, correct? Let's see what, what you did. If you got a, a dollar or an envelope from Cornelius, would you stand up? Okay. How much did you give away, man? <laughs> gave it all. You gave it all. Okay. I, so there would be about 10 people around here that got an envelope from Cornelius? Very good. Awesome, thank you, you may be seated. The principle is very simple. Whatever we sow, we reap. Whatever we give, we reap back. And Sam, you were the more reluctant one. No, I'm just joking, I'm just joking with you. I told him to do that to prove, prove a point, the illustration. Thank you, man, appreciate it. You guys may be seated. And seriously, you can, you can keep that dollar or you can give it, whatever you wanna do. The principle is really simple. If a farmer takes seed and just casts it out, and, or he takes it and he sprinkles a little bit out, he's going to get whatever he gave, whatever he sows. And what God is trying to teach here is that we actually choose what we will experience. The measure we sow will be the measure that we reap. The measure we sow will be the measure we reap. We choose what we will experience. I don't know about you, but man, I am experiencing amazing blessings from God. And, there, and I'm going to be really honest with you. There are times in my life where I wasn't sowing like I should, and God still blessed me because of his grace 
But do you know what I took that as? He was trying to get my attention. He was trying to test me to see what I would do with those blessings. And I caught on to it, and I started giving back those blessings. What, what we sow is what we will experience. When we are generous, we get to enjoy and experience God's measure of generosity. Um, and verse 9 says, our good deeds will be remembered forever. That's awesome. Uh, verse 9 and 10 says they freely share, or they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Now listen to this, verse 10. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Wow. You know what I've learned in my own life? that God will provide and increase those who are generous. Those who are generous are going to experience God's generosity because they are channels of generosity which he can work through. In other words, God knows who to be generous to because he knows they will be generous to. Two O's on that one. God knows who to be generous to because he knows they will be generous as well. Church, let's be a channel of generosity. Let's just be a channel that just flows generosity and giving. We'll find out how generous God is as we are generous. That's what the scripture is trying to teach us. That's the lesson involved in all of it. And I, I tell you what, church, I have in my personal life, I have been on both ends. I've been on both ends of experience and generosity. I have been on the end where I have been, someone has been generous to us, praise God. And I've been on the end of, of being generous to others. And you know what's in the middle of both? Joy. Joy. It's just more blessed to give than to receive. But I tell you what, it, it's nice to receive too sometimes, isn't it? And when someone blesses you, don't rob them of that blessing. Have you heard that before, right? No, 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 don't give that to me. Don't. Someone came up to us in the lobby a couple weeks ago and gave us a dollar and some change. That's all she had. And I said, thank you so much. It was like the widow's might that we read in Luke 24, 1 through 4, a couple weeks ago. I'm sorry, Luke 21 or 20. Point is, I'll get a correction on that later. She gave what she had. Do you know how much joy I had receiving that to give to the church a few weeks ago? Literally, she gave a dollar and some change to the church. She said, this is all I have today. I said, praise God. God will multiply this because you gave it willingly and cheerfully. And God is so good that he's going to increase her needs and resources because she gave like that. That's the promise. Church, I'm not a prosperity gospel teacher. I'm a generosity gospel teacher. When we're generous, we see the generosity of God. And it may not always come in the form of finances. It may come in the generosity of God's joy overwhelming in our, and overflowing in our lives. It may come from the generosity of peace because we obeyed God and so we have peace now. How many times has it been where we didn't give as we should and so we left without peace? But you can have peace when you're generous. It's amazing. Let me finish off with this scripture. And it says in verse, um, I'm going to read verse 11. It says, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. <laughs> wow. Let me read that again. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. That sounds good. But notice, it wasn't so you can be richer and have more. It was so you can be generous. You've probably heard the line, don't get richer to spend more, get richer to give more. This is the way God functions. This is what God wants in our hearts. Yes, you will be rich in every way so you can always be generous. And when we take our gifts or your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. 
So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they would joyfully express their thanks to God. He goes on to say this, as a result of your ministry, and he's talking about giving, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. Whatever the situation was in Jerusalem, it must have been dire because Paul was overwhelmed with joy to see the generosity of these churches. And he was saying, you're gonna experience so much joy from knowing that your investment, your giving has reaped eternal dividends. And he's saying, experience God's generosity. Have, have a taste of what it's like and be generous. Can I get kind of real with you for a little bit? Is that okay if I get a little honest and real? I mean, I've been honest and real the entire time. That's the way I always am. But I, I, I got something years ago, and, and, and God just been wanting me to say this and this angle and this approach, and it's really helped some other people I've talked to about it. But I, I want to put perspective into our spending real quick, okay? And I'm not accusing anyone of this. This is just something that God gave me and I want to share it. And it's really simple. Um, we will pour money into cell phone companies, car companies, mortgage companies, and education institutions, won't we? And they're all important. We need those to communicate. We need a car to get to work. We need a mortgage to live. Um, education for our careers, whatever it may be, those are all important. So don't get me wrong. We'll pour money into entertainment, movie, and food companies. We pour money into hobbies and leisure companies. And by the way, some of us are the reason Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A are posting some big profits this year. <laughs> that was a joke. We'll pour into oil companies. And if you and I are honest, if we're honest, we don't ask the question where that money's going, do we? We don't ask how many yachts the CEOs have of those companies, how many mansions they have and all those things. We don't typically ask that. We, we give, we, we put the money in there because there are services and needs that we have to function in life. Some of them are, are for entertainment and some aren't. And there's nothing wrong with hobbies and food and all that stuff. I like Chick-fil-A. I'm not a fan of Hobby Lobby that much. My wife loves it, okay? It's all good to do that, but we don't question where that goes, do we? Maybe we should more, shouldn't we? And maybe some of you do. Maybe we should wonder, where is my money going to Comcast, Xfinity, Verizon, wherever you go, whatever you buy? The beauty of the church is we don't just get to enjoy the family of God and worship on Sunday mornings and the ministry here at Calvary throughout the week. We also get to give God to the world. Giving to Calvary is doing something greater and bigger than any earthly company that exists. Did you know that? Because God's kingdom will never go bankrupt. Praise God. It will never go bankrupt. Our tithe and giving turns into transforming your family, your community, and our world for eternity. What company can say that their message and products help someone go to heaven? Anyone know a company or their products that help them find eternal life? And we will pour so much finances into those companies and they are treasures here on earth, but not eternal treasures, not eternal. We're not storing up eternity. And so that's why my wife and I, we looked at our finances and we said, how much are we wasting on things of this earth instead of giving to the kingdom of God? That's why we did that. 
because I want people to go to heaven. I see what takes place. And by the way, the more you serve, the more you see what's going on with our finances. It's incredible what we're doing here at this church. But let me, before I tell you what we're accomplishing, let me, let me talk about Black Friday real quick. Dear goodness, did anyone else get so many invites to buy things this past season? Black Friday week was an email I got. Ready? Black Friday starting now, which was Thursday. Got that email. Black Friday, the actual day. Oh, well, thank God, it finally got here. But wait, we're not done because we still want you to spend your money on our company and our stuff. Black Friday weekend. They turned it into a weekend now, didn't they? I'm not joking with you. I have the emails, although I deleted quite a few of them because I couldn't stand them. Ready? Here's the new one. Cyber Monday starts today, which is Sunday. You're getting the gist, right? Cyber Monday, finally, thank God. But wait, we're not done. Cyber Monday week. And just to make sure we cap it off, it's Giving Tuesday the next day, which was a good one. That was actually a good thing, right? But you know what's interesting? Is they will hit you up. Marketing will hit you up. I took marketing. Uh, in, in high school, which is kind of weird, but it was like college level marketing. They, they make sure they gear towards you and get to your impulses, get to your desires and needs so that you will go and spend. You all of a sudden, you're like, wow, I think I need to buy something all of a sudden. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have the urge to buy anything. Now I do. That's literally what they do. They design these things to hook you and to go, yeah, you need this. Right? But the thing is, is I don't really hear people get mad when these companies are asking for your money. But for some reason, when churches ask or take collections or offerings, people get upset and don't want to come to church. I don't understand that. We're giving to eternal life. We're doing, we're putting money into what's going to change the world for eternity. Let me, let me explain what I mean. We help plant Deepwater Church, which is now in uh, Camden with a pastor and a team years ago. We helped plant Anchor Church in Milford with a pastor and a large team of people. We helped revitalize and relaunch Barclay Assembly of God in Maryland with a pastor and team. And we can thank Pastor Kuhn for that, and we can thank Debbie Everett for that. And all the people who left here in the past year to go help that church in Maryland because it was dying, it was dead. And now their, their attendance is up. They're doing great things in that community. They're serving the community. Your money is going to help a church be revitalized and relaunched. Praise God. I don't know if you knew that. I want to make sure you knew that. We helped send off Mike and Jamie Holmes in the Clayton Smyrna area this past August to plant a church. We have Pastor Kuhn who continues to serve in other churches in Delaware to make sure they stay alive and well. And he's been helping save and restore and keep churches healthy in Delaware because he's our sectional rep for the assignments of God here in Delaware. So your, your finances to fund pastor all those years was helping us do that. And now he's doing it for free. A healthy kids and youth, young adult ministry that's saving, preserving, equipping the next generation to lead the way. Church, it is so important that we have a kids' ministry. It's so important that we have a nursery. Praise God. It's so important that we have a nursery so that you can come in here and concentrate. And by the way, when I say all this, every single ministry is looking for volunteers that will love kids. The youth ministry. We need to help our youth understand Jesus and know the difference between truth and a lie and all those other things and to help them be strong in their faith. We have a young adult ministry that's growing and thriving. Thank God for Sam leading the way and Brandon and Lindsay. Thank God that we can even uh, support them to be missionaries and pastors here to do ministry for our next generation. If we don't have another generation next, where, where would this church be? Your funding, your, your giving, your offerings make a difference in the next generation. I'm not done, though. 
There's more. We have a healthy group ministry, although we've taken a couple punches and, and curveballs because, uh, because of COVID and being online or in person. We have a healthy group ministry, and we're still trying to grow that to help people come become disciple makers. We have numerous outreaches that reach locally and internationally, like OCC, Operation Christmas Child, Thanksgiving Feast, our productions, which we're working on for Easter, Convoy of Hope, Feed the Hope, Food Pantry Distribution, Bible Distribution, Code Purple for the Homeless. We partner with them. Those are just a few. We have salvations happening here and online. We just got done celebrating water baptism service. We're giving missions locally and internationally. We've given over $161,000 to missions locally and internationally. Gifts are blessed. Praise God. Our, we've been blessed because we've been blessing. When we shut down and didn't have church in-house, we decided that right away, it was kind of cool. It was really cool, actually. Right away, God said, don't you dare stop the food pantry. Keep it going. You'll figure out a way. And we did. But what's cool is I went to Margaret and told her we're not stopping the food pantry. She came to me and was saying the exact same thing. Because God spoke to both of us and said, don't do it. We had a local band give us 5,000 plus towards our food pantry. We just won a $7,000 grant to our food pantry. Because of our food drive that we recently did, a little friendly competition, they just awarded us $20,000 to our food pantry. We gave more cans of food than Canada combined in Delaware. And they said, you can keep the food pantry items, and we're going to give you $20,000. Oh, by the way, here's an extra 500 so you can buy Bibles, because the lady, Kapika, who brought this whole thing to us because she works for them, her dream was to give out Bibles for new believers. So they're giving her an extra $500. So what happened is, yes, <laughs> praise God. What happened is, when we gave all those things, and we gave to this ministry, God multiplied it. The scripture is proving itself. We're about to sign papers on 1.3 acres of land on Governor's Avenue, because Dr. Rowe, do you anyone remember Dr. Rowe? His doctor's office? Yeah. He wanted to gift this land to a church that's doing something for the community. And thank you to John Nichols for the connection, and we sign papers here in the next week or two and the land is ours for free, no expense to us. We went through a crazy, stormy year, literally. We found out, this is what people don't know, we found out that we need to reseal our entire roof again because of the leaking that we were dealing with. That's $90,000. I don't want to spend $90,000 on a building or just a roof, you know what I'm saying? There's needs that we need here or for, for our community before that. Well, God decides to send a tornado. <laughs> but someone was in a prayer group the night before and said, I, I, I felt God say that the, that the church is going to come into a blessing. And then the next day we got hit by a tornado. And I said, someone needs to check their ears because that wasn't the blessing. <laughs> Until... We found out the insurance company would cover the entire top roof, which would be around $220,000 project. That's God. On top of that, we have a whole new facility over there in the classrooms because of what happened. We had to get everything new on the roof, the tiles, everything. New air duct system, new HVAC, everything. We have like a new building over there for the kids that's cleaner and safer and better because God said, you've been generous. I'm going to do it a weird way, but just trust me and I'm going to bless you. You can't make this stuff up. What you don't realize is we were worried about how we're going to pay for that stuff because our giving, can I be really honest with you guys today? Our giving has gone down this year. It hasn't gotten better. It was good when we were in church, or we were an online church, but then when we came back to in-house, all of a sudden our giving dropped. It was weird. So we were sitting here praying, God, how are we going to be able to do these repairs? How are we going to afford this? And God's like, I have you. I have you. I'm going to take care of you. This is why I, I, I'm watching God's generosity just unfold right before my eyes. 
And we couldn't be here today without the generosity of years of church members saying, I'm going to give to the work of the ministry. And we are sitting, this is what Pastor Kuhn always says, we are sitting in the seat of someone else's sacrifice. And we need to honor their sacrifice by continuing to be sacrificial in our giving. Praise God. But one of my favorite things of all this year is how many new faces and new people we're reaching. This building is important, but there's nothing more important than people. This building is so important, but man, it's so good to see so many new people and see us reaching to so many people around the world. Praise God for that. God is doing something good in this situation. He's making the most of online church. And so many people have visited our church because of online ministry and because of this pandemic. So I give God the glory and praise. And I just want you to know that your generosity is making an eternal impact, eternal dividends. It's not in vain, in other words. And we promise to be good stewards of our finances. I give to this church because I know what we're doing. I know what we're doing. I want to encourage you, if you've never give, uh, given to Calvary and the ministry we do here, I want to encourage you to give for the first time. Now, if you're a guest, we don't put that on you at all. But if you're a believer of God, I would encourage you to obey God and give, to trust him. Maybe you're an occasional giver. Maybe every once in a while you give, you know. I give when I have it. That's awesome. But I want to encourage you to go to that next step on the ladder and say, I'm going to be a faithful giver, whether it's a monthly gift, whether it's bi-weekly or weekly, whatever it may be. I want to encourage you to trust God and commit to giving on a regular basis. And if you've been giving faithfully, however your, your, your giving works, whether it's pulled out once a month or, or weekly or bi-weekly, I want to encourage you to continue to be generous. Thank you so much for your generosity. It means so much. Because we're watching God do amazing things. We're helping so many people. And God is blessing our generosity. Amen.